1842 was a year of incredible hardship and toil throughout Ireland. In the years prior to the infamous potato famine that started in 1845, a young carriage driver by the name of James Donnelly took his young bride, Johanna, and their young son, James Jr., and struck out for a fresh beginning in the frontier lands of Canada. Now, unknowing to the young man at the time, in doing so, he set in motion a chain of events that would result in an ungodly massacre in the Canadian state of Ontario. James and Joanna were indeed the foundations of the infamous Irish settler clan that became known simply as the Black Donnellys. Their presence in the settlement town of Bidolph, Ontario, led to divisions within the local communities as people took sides in a dispute that would last for many years and ultimately end with a decisive mob-driven massacre. But before we start with this week's tale, I'd like to take this moment to ask, if you haven't already, to please subscribe to this channel. Smash that like button and round off the trifecta of support by ringing that notifications bell so that you will be updated as and when new content is uploaded by yours truly. Now, as is customary, I'd like to shout out this week, especially to new subscribers, Gabrielle Both, Paul Wilbanks and Big Mike. Now, an extra special cheers goes out to Crush42Mash, who requested that I look into this event for potential inclusion on this channel. So without further ado, let's get into the wranglings of a family that ultimately became known as the Black Donnellys here on the flip side. As the coastline of Ireland disappeared from their gaze, James and Johanna Donnelly could only wonder at what awaited them in the cold and hardened land of Ontario, Canada. James was taking his young family, including their young son James Jr., and was aiming to start afresh. Their one goal was to acquire the one thing that, that was, due to the governing law in Ireland at the time, impossible for them to accomplish in their own country, and that was to own land. Wherever you are in the world, land means power. It is the source of wealth, and ultimately land allows one to have independence. Little else is known about the young family's journey, except that they ended up settling as squatters on a tract of land in the Bidolf township of Ontario in the early months of 1842. Now, as was customary at the time, squatters would arrive and settle on a piece of land and set about clearing it. Once they'd felled the trees and cultivated the soil to a point of it becoming productive, they could then lay claim to that plot of land. Now, in most cases, the applications for the plots resulted in a positive outcome for the applicants, thus allowing them to gain a foothold in this new country. A plot of land on which to start one's legacy was, after all, the goal of many of the new arrivals into the area at the time. Settling on a 100-acre tract of land within concession number six, known locally as the Roman Line, due to the number of Roman Catholic settlers that resided in the area, the Donnelly set to work and what back-breaking work it was. Over the course of the coming years, James and Johanna would toil from dawn until dusk, working the land and clearing it, making it productive. Now, over these arduous years, Johanna also bore seven more children. These additional children were, by name, William, John, Patrick, Michael, Robert, and Thomas. And there was also one daughter in the brood, and her name was Jenny. An additional young girl by the name of Bridget, who was actually James's niece, also lived with them at the time. As the years passed, the land took shape. It had been cleared by the blood, sweat and toil of James, Johanna and their growing brood of children. Now, in addition, James had also constructed a barn on the land and was, by all accounts, a model settler at that time. Now, far from the rosy future that James and Johanna had planned for their growing family, their troubles were only just beginning. And when the time came and they decided that they were ready to apply for ownership of the land that they had toiled on, it was then that they met their first hurdle. It came as a big surprise to both James and Johanna that the land into which they had invested so much of their time and effort did in fact already have an owner. What should have been a simple process to transfer the ownership of the land to the Donnellys soon became an embattled legal process within the courts between the Donnellys and the landowner, 
a man by the name of James Grace. Now, unknown to the Donnellys, the landowner had acquired the land via a purchase from the Canada Company. And once legally his, James Grace had then, prior to the Donnellys squatting on it, leased that same tract of land to another entity by the name of Patrick Farrell. And it wasn't until some 14 years after their arrival that in 1856 that landowner initiated a court action to evict the Donnellys from his land. And while their future looked bleak, there was at least some cons consolation from the proceedings. In accordance with standard North American practices at the time, the presiding judge, in recognition of the work the Donnellys had invested in transforming the land in question, duly split the plot of land into two equal parcels of 50 acres apiece. He then awarded the lesser worked northern parcel of the 50 acres to the Donnellys and the more productive southern parcel of land to his neighbour, Farrell. But despite this relative win, and to a greater extent, the Donnellys felt cheated out of what they saw as rightfully theirs. They remained adamant that they would lay claim to and repossess the remaining plot of 50 acres in time. It was, after all, that plot into which they had focused their greatest efforts. Over the coming years, it was this claim to the land that would ignite ill will between the Donnellys and Farrell families. By all accounts from the time, there would be arguments that almost came to blows on numerous occasions when Patrick Farrell would ridicule James Donnelly by thanking him for presenting him with 50 acres of cleared and productive lands that went on then to feed the Farrell family. It was a dispute that would soon come to an end, along with the life of one of the two main protagonists. At a barn dance in spring of 1857, the ill will between James Donnelly and Patrick Farrell eventually boiled over to a point that the two men came to blows. There are various accounts of what transpired next, uh, but in the end, Farrell suffered a blow to the head from a hand spike that had been thrown by Donnelly. Farrell, unfortunately, never recovered from the injuries he sustained in the fight and ultimately died two days later. Through fear of not wanting to be incarcerated for murder, James Donnelly went into hiding. Now, in a strange twist in the tale, Farrell left behind a young son, who went on to be adopted and ultimately raised by the Donnelly family until he reached adulthood. This act alone was seen by some at the time as testament to the fact that the death of Farrell was indeed an accident, something that happened in the heat of the moment, and it was not something intended on the part of James Donnelly. Now, as time wore on, and not wanting to become a fugitive in early 1859, James Donnelly ultimately turned himself in, and he did so to Jim Hodgins, a sympathetic justice of the peace. Now, in the ensuing trial in London, Ontario, when all the facts of the case were presented, James was ultimately sentenced to death and was due to be hung on September 17, 1859. Unable to consider a future without her husband, a petition for clemency was started by Johanna Donnelly, and ultimately resulted in the sentence being reduced to seven years of almost solitary confinement in Kingston Penitentiary. Now, unbeknown to James, due to his incarceration, the seeds of what would become a murderous feud had now been sown. Resentment was growing within the township of Bidolf. Resentment between those who supported the actions of Donnelly and those who didn't. Battle lines were being drawn. Friends became enemies, neighbors, became strangers. With James incarcerated, the responsibility of the children and the household was passed firmly to Johanna. She had to learn very quickly how to survive in what was an unforgiving land during a, a particularly hard time in history. Now, as the years passed, she made sure that her sons could look after themselves. And given that they were the common butt of school ridicule uh, by other kids in the town, the Donnelly boys soon became a force to be reckoned with. It was said at the time that Johanna would pray on her knees, requesting that the souls of her son would forever frizzle in hell if they ever forgave an enemy or failed to take revenge for any act of violence directed towards them. Johanna had, in her own way, moulded them into a strong, no-nonsense, almost gang-like assembly of young men. Given the lack of any fatherly guidance, the boys grew boisterous, loud, and above all, socially troublesome. They soon became the ire of the local town of Lucan, where they would fall foul quite often with the authorities. 
They were often blamed for crimes committed around the region and had numerous accusations of being involved with arson, trespassing, thefts and assault on law enforcement officers as well as on civilian residents of Bidolf Township. While the Donnellys were not convicted of any of the accusations brought against them over the years, they were, it seemed, a common denominator and source for the growing sense of ill will within the township. Now, it was not just the behaviour of the boys that turned heads. Johanna herself was also noted as greeting local enforcement officers with a colour of language unbecoming of a lady at the time. Now, in time, James Donnelly became a free man, and once his sentence was served, he returned home. Upon leaving incarceration in 1866, it wasn't long before old wounds opened. Feuds that were thought long gone reared their ugly heads once again. Now, amidst the chaos, barns were burned and accusations flew. The Donnellys were sealing their fate with their brash attitudes and willingness to engage in violence. Never stepping down from a confrontation, as instilled in them by their patriarch, the Donnelly boys gained a nasty reputation verging on that normally reserved for thugs and gangsters of the time. While it appeared the Donnellys were out simply looking for trouble, at any turn it has to be said that the flames of resentment towards them were fanned greatly by the one entity that one would normally turn to in a small town setting, the local priest. Father John Connolly, a staunch Roman Catholic priest, had also emigrated from Ireland at or around the time the Donnellys did, and he didn't need to camouflage his distaste for the Donnelly family. He'd long held great disdain for James Donnelly after James had publicly and in front of his own congregation taken issue with the hatred of Protestants that the priest would very openly advertise in his sermons. James Donnelly denounced the man of God and informed him in front of his congregation that he would from that point forward attend services at the Roman Catholic Church in London, Ontario. As the years progressed and the Donnelly boys became more interested in starting their own ventures, it was the business established by William Donnelly in 1873 that brought the situation to a head. The Donnelly stagecoach line was established at around May of 1873 with William at the helm and with the help of his brothers, Michael, John and Thomas. The business ran stages between the towns and villages of London, Lucan and Exeter. Now, so successful was the business that it even started to impact the business of the official mail stages that had been established in the area since 1838. A competing stage business, the Hawkshaw Stage Line, soon also started to feel the competition of the Donnellys biting hard, and not wanting the boys to have a monopoly in the area, the owner at the time elected to sell the company to a husky-voiced roughneck of a man named Patrick Flanagan. And thus the stage was set for yet another feud to erupt, and erupt it did. In the ensuing years, barns were burned, stages were smashed and destroyed, horses were savagely beaten and killed, and stables also set ablaze. The majority of the violence stemmed from what was called the stagecoach feud, and was laid fairly and squarely at the feet of the Donnelly family. Now, as had become the norm, the Donnelly brothers were accused of many of the crimes, but actually were only convicted of just a few lesser incidents, mainly of public affray. Now, all of this ongoing violence in the community gave the local priest, Father Connolly, fuel to his dislike of the Donnelly family. It was no secret that he actively invited a solution to removing the Donnelly family from his parish. Now, in June of 1879, the priest set up what would be called the Peace Society in Bidolf Township. Given robbery was so rife in the region at the time, he asked people who attended St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church to pledge their support for the society. Now, this support required the need for members of the society to consent to their homes and farm buildings to being searched for the presence of stolen property. Now, it goes without saying that the Donnelly family did not sign the pledge, a move that further enraged the already motivated priest. Now, over time, a splinter group was also formed within the ranks of the Peace Society. It was almost considered a regulating body and named the Vigilance Committee. It was seen as an extrajudicial element within the Bidolf community, and it also came as no surprise that some of the members of this committee were suggested as being responsible for many of the crimes committed in Bidolf at the time. Now, with all good intentions, the goals of the newly formed peace society was to uphold peace and reinforce its goals of maintaining our harmonious community. 
and it was something that the Donnelly family were never shy about ignoring. James Donnelly was liberal enough in his religious awareness that his actions to donate a sizable amount of money towards the construction of an Anglican church in Bidolf was enough to cause outrage within the ranks of the Peace Society. Now something had to be done in the eyes of the residents of the village. While the majority of them were law-abiding, it, it felt to many of them that they were prisoners in their own homes, afraid to venture out at night through fear of being attacked or caught up in the feudal violence of the time. And so they started to plot the demise of the Donnelly clan. Now, in August of 1879, members of the Vigilance Committee, many of them neighbours of the Donnelly family, started meeting at the Cedar Swamp Schoolhouse in Bidolf. They would go on to have regular meetings at the place of learning through and into the early 1880s. Now, one of the main players in the Vigilance Committee was a man by the name of James Carroll, a long-time neighbour of the Donnellys. What was considered to be the final straw in the feuds within the community led to the burning down of a barn owned by local resident Patrick Ryder. In the ensuing investigation, no evidence could be laid to blame at the feet of the Donnellys. Well, none that would stick anyway although local sentiment had the Donnellys pinged for the crime. Tired from the constant warring, the community had simply had enough of the Donnellys and decided to take the law into their own hands once they heard that there was no supporting evidence linking the Donnellys to the burning of the barn. Now this news ultimately, ultimately reached the congregation of St. Patrick's Church where Father Connolly addressed his congregation and declared that an evil had fallen among the community and that there would be a reward of $500 for the detection of the wicked persons and he further vowed that the guilty parties would be banished for their sins. Now by accounts at the time, and after a rallying speech by James Carroll, a mob was to be formed and it would head to the Donnelly's house on a date given. Uh, their goal was to persuade, by any means necessary, the Donnelly's into confessing to crimes that had been committed in the local community. It was decided that the mob would encircle the Donnelly house until the menfolk had been located, handcuffed and taken to a nearby forest where they would be hung from trees by their necks to a point of almost suffocation in order to be able to communicate their submission. Now, this was a compromised agreement within the attendees as there were those present who simply wanted the Donnellys dead. February 3rd, 1880 started out in the Donnelly household pretty much the same as any other. After the morning ablutions, the family sat together for breakfast, discussing their plans for the day ahead. And after the table was cleared, James Donnelly sat down at the kitchen table with his son Tom and asked him to write a letter to Alderman Edmund Meredith, the London lawyer who was handling the ongoing case against Patrick Ryder for defamation that the Donnellys had brought against him. In the letter, Tom wrote the following. Mr Meredith, Sir, on the 15th of last month, Pat Ryder's barn was burned. All the Vigilance Committee, as one, pointed to my family as the ones that did it. Ryder found out that all my boys were at a wedding that night. He at once arrested me on suspicion and also sent a constable after my wife to St. Thomas. The trial has been postponed four different times, although we are ready for our trial at any time. They examined a lot of witnesses but can't find anything against us. Ryder swore that we lived as neighbours to each other for almost 30 years and never had any differences and there were no reasons for arresting us, only that others were blaming us for everything. The presiding magistrates are Old Grant and a newly made one, Casey. They're making us look like mad dogs. Mr McDermott is attending on our behalf. They had the first trial in Lucan and tomorrow again I am informed that they are going to be sending us for trial without a tittle of evidence. If so, I will telegraph you when we start for London to meet us at the City Hotel and get us bailed to take our trial before the judge. And I want you to handle the case on our behalf. There is not the slightest case for our arrest. It seems hard to see a man and woman over 60 years of age now being dragged around as a laughing stock. Now once the letter was delivered, the day carried on as it normally would. At roughly four o'clock, Johnny, James and Tom Donnelly returned to their house on Roman Line. This time frame was given by local resident William Casey, as he stated that he remembered the sound of the Donnelly's carriage speeding down Roman Line in a manner that he described as being reckless. 
Given that he'd been interrupted from his work, he noted the time as a matter of fact. Casey also noted that in the company of the Donnelly boys was a local labourer by the name of Johnny O'Connor. Given that James Donnelly needed assistance on the farm, they'd secured the help of O'Connor, who would join them that night for their evening meal, and he would then stay the night in the Donnelly residence in order to be able to start work at the crack of dawn the following morning. Now little did anyone know that a plan had been set in action that would culminate in many of the family members never seeing the light of the following morning. Just as the family had finished their evening meal, a knock on the door signaled a surprise visit from one of the few remaining townsfolk still on speaking terms with the Donnellys, a man by the name of Fihili. Given an important harvest was about to be recovered, he feigned his visitation as a, as a way to simply bestow good fortune for that harvest. In fact, Fahili was on a mission, undercover if you like, for the Vigilance Committee. He was in fact at the Donnelly household to check the lay of the land and to see who was around in the house. Now one of his oversights on that night was the voice he thought belonged to John Donnelly he'd heard coming from Mr Donnelly's bedroom. It was in fact the voice of Johnny O'Connor. John Donnelly was not in the house at all as he had gone to a friend's house by the name of Big Jim Keefe to pick up a vehicle in order to travel to a trial hearing in London, Ontario the following morning. And given the distance back to town and to his own residence, John Donnelly had opted to stay the night at his friend's. And it was this decision that ultimately saved his life. Fahili reported back to the growing mob as they waited at the schoolhouse and on his word that the Donnellys were pretty much all accounted for, the plan to attack was laid. Now once the decision to attack the Donnellys was made, the Peace Society got together at roughly one o'clock in the morning to drink alcohol before they mounted the attack on the family. The men used the liquor as a way to numb their senses, as well as use it as a way to enhance their courage and their motivation. Now with enough liquor in their systems, the mob began to walk in the direction of the Donnelly's home. Many witnesses at the time, among the townsfolk, stated that they could hear the group of men coming down Roman line. When the mob finally arrived at the house, they encircled the, the perimeter of the property and stood there menacing, waiting for the signal to be given. James Carroll then took the first steps inside the house. His actions were considered to be the first attack of what would become a massacre. His intent was to create an element of surprise. The Carroll walked into the room and slowly took a set of handcuffs out of his pocket. He had received the restraints from a local enforcement officer by the name of Constable Hodgins. He then duly handcuffed Tom Donnelly, who, while he was still asleep. And once Tom Donnelly was handcuffed, Carroll proclaimed that he was under arrest. Just as Tom sat up in bed, along with Mrs Donnelly and Bridget Donnelly, due to all the commotion. Carroll then slowly moved from Tom's bedroom into James Donnelly's bedroom, where he noticed that John Donnelly was nowhere to be found. Given that the main sentiment shared by the mob was to ultimately kill the Donnelly family in its entirety, in one place and at one time, the absence of John Donnelly now placed the proverbial spanner in the works. The ensuing commotion woke up James Donnelly, who noted that his son was handcuffed and proclaimed, What have you got against us now? James Carroll responded by saying that they were being charged with yet another crime a statement to which Tom Donnelly responded by requesting that Carroll read the warrant. Now, given the fact that there was no warrant to support that claim, Carroll was said to, at that moment, have let out a signal for the men surrounding the house to come storming in with their clubs. And enter they did. The violence began. Now, while the men were preoccupied with beating James Donnelly, his wife, Johanna, and Tom Donnelly, their daughter Jenny was able to escape and race up the stairs in order to hide from their attackers. Johnny O'Connor was also so terrified that he hid underneath James Donnelly's bed. And it was his good fortune that the mob were not expecting him to be there that night, so they wasted no time in searching for him. And it was because of this, little did they know that they were leaving an eyewitness to the massacre. Now, having been a fighter all his life, but now elevated in years and no longer as agile or potent as in his younger days, the first to fall victim to the mob was James Donnelly. Being struck repeatedly about the head with an unknown instrument by his attacker, James Maher, the Donnelly elder was found through autopsy to have suffered massive brain damage, 
Johanna Donnelly, on the other hand, fought hard against her attackers. She was known to be acutely proficient with a wooden club known as a shillelagh and was, and was known to use that as a weapon of choice when going into battle, so to speak. However, she was eventually beaten to the ground by James Carroll, while Tom Donnelly, even though handcuffed, was fighting extremely hard against numerous attackers in order to protect both his family and himself from further injury. Now, he eventually broke free from his attackers and ran towards the front door, but as he was running, a man by the name of Tom Ryder was waiting for him. Ryder set about Donnelly with a pitchfork and thrust the sharp points into Donnelly's body multiple times. Now, as the life was ebbing away from his limp body, he was carried back into the house and laid out on the kitchen table, where Carol then removed the handcuffs he'd placed on the younger Donnelly. Now, in a final act of desecration against the wounded man, James Carroll asked that somebody in the crowd open the head of Tom Donnelly with a shovel, an act that was ultimately carried out by either Jim, Jim Toohey or Patrick Quigley, who were close acquaintances of Carroll within the vigilance community. As the violence started to subside, the mob realized that they only had three of the Donnellys at their feet. They'd seen Jenny Donnelly at the beginning of the route, but she was subsequently nowhere to be seen. A search for the house located the terrified girl hiding underneath one of the beds, and she was duly and unceremoniously beaten limp and laid out eventually on the kitchen floor with her remaining family members. Now, in a final act of bloodletting on that night, the family's dog was the last to be silenced. Its head caved in with a shovel for the simple fact that it wouldn't stop barking. Now, as the mob doused the home with gasoline in preparation to burn it, and with it the still living members of the Donnelly family, the eyewitness to the massacre, Johnny O'Connor, was able to make good his escape. Making plans to also hunt down and kill the remaining Donnelly family members, the mob watched as the Donnelly house burned to the ground, taking with it the four family members of a clan whose presence and actions spawned a legacy that continues to divide a community even to this day. Now, having grown his business and his own family to a point of wanting to start his own household, one of the Donnelly sons, Will, had established his home at a place known as Whalen Corners. Now, once the bloodletting at the main Donnelly house in Bidolf was done, the mob turned their focus to Will. At roughly two o'clock in the morning, the Peace Society arrived at Whalen Corners. They surrounded Will's house in a similar way as they had done to the Donnelly house in Bidolf. However, the difference was that the men were not as relaxed as they were at the beginning of the initial rampage, given that they were now pretty amped up on adrenaline from their first attack. They decided to try and wake and get Will to come outside of the house, but instead of storming the house itself, they attempted to do so by beating his prized stallion. Now, the problem with this plan was that the stables were so far from the home, nobody inside the house would have been able to hear what would, what would have been happening in the stables. Now, one of the mob, a man by the name of Jim Ryder, called out for Donnelly by name. Will, he said while carrying a shotgun to the side of the door. Will Donnelly, come on out. Now, Will was eventually woken up by the calling out of his name. However, when his brother John, who was also staying at his brother's house uh, that night, opened the door, he was greeted by a hail of gunshots to the chest and groin. And he was struck numerous times, some that pierced his lung, broke his collarbone and several ribs. Now, as John dropped to the ground, two of his attackers, McLaughlin and Ryder, walked up to the body and fired seven more shots into it. This was seen as a form of punishment for his actions against the community. Now, on seeing the felling of her brother-in-law, Nora Donnelly, Will Donnelly's wife, rushed out, and when she saw John's body on the ground, she tried to drag him into safety, but he was way too heavy for her to move. Will Donnelly hid in the bedroom and was able to peer through a window in order to get a glimpse of the individuals who were attacking them. John Kennedy and Carol were only a few feet from the bed where he was hiding. He could also place the faces of Big Mike Heenan, William Carroll and Patrick Ryder, but the other faces were obscured by the darkness. John Donnelly ultimately succumbed to his wounds only five minutes after being attacked. Given that the mob were so worn out from their previous attacks, they decided to just survey the perimeter until someone was to show their face from inside the house, 
at which time it was decided that they would enter and finish off any survivors. But as the adrenaline drained from their bodies, so did their enthusiasm and bloodlust. One of the central figures in the murderous actions, Jim Fahili, eventually exclaimed, There's been enough bloodshed tonight, boys. Let's go home. Now, as the mob dissipated, the remaining members of the Donnelly family hid in the house, and it took almost three hours before the murderous crowd had completely left the property. Had the intent remained, it was widely thought at the time that the crowd who had since, during the initial attack on the main Donnelly residence, had learned the whereabouts of John Donnelly, that they would have then finished off with a further assault on the house of Big Jim Keane. Fortunately for the Keane family, this was not to be. The bloodletting was done. No more attacks were made against the remaining Donnelly family members and the community could start to mend its wounds. In a somewhat macabre twist, the investigating team that initially surveyed the Donnelly house noted that there were four skulls along with the, the associated skeletal remains of the four Donnelly family members. However, on their return, once the ruins had cooled, the skulls were nowhere to be found. It seemed some people had come back looking for souvenirs, as it were, from the actions of the previous night. Souvenirs that have never been recovered. Now, two trials ensued and were held at the courthouse in Red Doubt Street in London, Ontario. Now, in between the preliminary hearings and the trial, there was a change of venue request, which was ultimately rejected. The Crown felt that a fair trial could not be obtained in Middlesex County, as it was too biased against the Donnelly family and one of the key witnesses for the prosecution was Johnny O'Connor, the labourer who had hidden in the Donnelly house on the night in question and who had managed to make good his escape before the house was torched. O'Connor had witnessed the whole massacre from start to finish. Now, as would be expected, the vigilantes did everything they could in their power to try and keep Johnny from testifying. Michael O'Connor, Johnny's father, owned two houses on Francis Street in the village of Lucan. Now, one of the houses was also known to have run a bootlegging operation from time to time, while the other house, at one time, had been rented to one of the Donnelly family, namely Bob Donnelly. Now, on April 13th, 1880, the vigilantes burnt the house of Connor to the ground, and the vigilantes harassed not only the father, but also Johnny's mother, Mary and it was on one day while she was out shopping in London, Ontario, that she passed by a character by the name of Patrick Grouchy Ryder. He threatened and insulted her to which she laid a claim against him for the use of abusive language. Now, at the ensuing court appearance, fellow vigilantes swore that Grouchy, as they called him, was in fact in the town of Bidolf at the time of the alleged infraction. And this subsequently led to the charges against him being dropped. Through all of this intimidation, however, young Johnny Connor was not deterred from testifying. Through all the convolutions of the trial, it was inevitable that their ultimate decision would either go against the Donnellys or indeed end, as it did in this first trial, with a hung jury. After four and a half hours of deliberation, the foreman of the jury announced that there was no chance of an agreement on a final verdict. One juror even went so far as to say that he would not have convicted Carroll even if he'd seen the killing himself. Another said he did not want to convict Carroll on Johnny O'Connor's word alone. The remaining jury members voted for acquittal out of fear of retribution from the dozens of influential local names implicated within the accused. In the end, one jury member was undecided. Seven wanted to acquit and four wanted to convict all of which resulted in a hung jury. A second trial was initiated but fared no better than the first in its outcome. The fact that the community and trial were strongly polarised along religious lines guaranteed both the outcome and the decisions of the jury and the judges alike. Focusing on the Bidolf Peace Society, it was widely thought that members, along with members of other local movements, like the White Boys, uh, used their influence to pressure the decisions made in the courtroom. This, combined with the lack of hard evidence, left the prosecution with no chance of securing a guilty verdict. There was also the sentiment of not wanting a guilty verdict given the backlash such a resolution would have created within the local community. Even the Crown Attorney at the time, a man by the name of Charles Hutchinson, wrote to Crown Prosecutor Emilius Irving, stating 
that trying to secure a guilty verdict was in fact a waste of time and money. This was due simply to the negative feelings towards the Donnelly family in general. Now, in closing, the legacy of the Donnelly family continues in Canadian folklore, and the story of their murder is told throughout Canadian and American farming communities to this day. Despite the popularity of the Donnelly story throughout North America, some inhabitants of the village of Lucan and the township of Bidolf have tried to suppress the subject from being popularized. Up until recently, even among those who were born and raised in the Lucan area, many had never heard of the story of the Donnelly Massacre until they had become adults. Now, the publication of Thomas Kelly's The Black Donnellys in 1954 generated a lot of interest in the case. The family tombstone with the inscription murdered was the focus of both curiosity and vandalism over the years. Eventually, the remaining descendants of the Donnelly family chose to have the original tombstone replaced. Now, in recent years, several newcomers to the area have started businesses centered on the Donnelly story, creating tourism venues from visitors fascinated by the events surrounding their deaths. This, much to the dismay of some of the older inhabitants. One of the well-known myths that has since stemmed from this whole uh, course of events uh, is that that some call the Midnight Lady and it is suggested by some to be the ghost of Johanna Donnelly herself, as she is said to ride a thoroughbred stallion up and down the Roman line every February 4th. Now, another myth is that the ghosts of the murdered family members can be seen floating in the fields near the murder site, and that the horses, and that horses will not ride past the former Donnelly homestead after midnight. Well, there you have it, folks. A bit of a long one this week, but what a tale that was. And it was something that, requ that was requested of me by one of the channel subscribers. Now, if you did enjoy the story, please do add a like to the video. I'd also like to request, as always, that if you haven't already, to please subscribe to the channel and slam the notifications bell so that you'll be updated as and when new content is available from yours truly. Now, in closing, I'd like to wish you all the best uh, please do stay well, stay happy, and above all, stay healthy. And please uh, like this story. Um, if you do have something that you'd like me to investigate and potentially include uh, as content on the channel, please mention it uh, down in the comments below. But until I see you again, I wish you all the best. And please come back very soon to the flip side.